Mars, this is Kelly Mara here. Happy holidays and welcome back to my channel. Or if you're new to the pond, go ahead and take a dive. You might like it here. I can't believe it's almost been a year since I started doing YouTube and I still have no idea what I'm doing most of the time. But if you guys have been around my channel for a bit, you might know that I did a series once redesigning and rewriting Yandere Simulator characters. When I ended my Yansim redesign series, I got quite a few people suggesting I do redesigns of Miraculous Ladybug. And I was hesitant about it at first because although I used to follow its early development, I kind of dropped off and never watched the show when it finally aired. But I've really missed doing redesigns and I've been meaning to get into MLB anyway, so I decided to finally start the series and give a little review of my first impressions, talk about some glaring issues, and offer solutions to fix those issues. So while I'm not going to do a full rewrite, as the title suggests, I will be doing a character breakdown of Marinette, a redesign of her ladybug suit, and suggest alternatives to her character that in my opinion would help address some of the issues while staying consistent to the show's current tone, genre, and target audience. So if you were hoping that I would turn Miraculous Ladybug into an epic fantasy story for an older audience, that's not happening. And before I get into the video, I also want to clarify what this video is not. A disclaimer, if you will. It is not a video meant to trash Miraculous Ladybug, nor is it an attempt to apply adult logic to what is clearly meant to be a children's show, which, to be honest, doesn't really try to be anything more than that, at least in the first couple seasons. Sometimes you have shows that are family-friendly but are appealing to people of all ages, like Gravity Falls, Avatar, Steven Universe, and Shira with varying degrees of success, but Miraculous Ladybug is none of those shows, and I went into the binge with that mindset. But even with my expectations on the literal floor, there was still some issues that would stick out to me as being weird even if I watched it as a kid, and I will be discussing them today. So for those of you who don't know, Miraculous Ladybug is a 3D animated series about French animal-themed superheroes who fight supervillains created by the show's main villain, Hawk Moth. The idea of Ladybug was first conceptualized in 2005 by Thomas Astruc, and early artworks of it imply a grittier tone more similar to Marvel and DC superhero comics. I also heard that initially they wanted to do 2D animation for the show, but it was difficult for them to track the spots on Ladybug's suit, which ended up giving people motion sickness. So in the end, they decided to go with 3D animation because they could then create a texture with the spots that would ensure they stayed in the right place at all times. I also remember the creators talking about how 3D helped with more dynamic camera movement because there's going to be a lot of action in the show, which really got me hyped, but then I forgot about it. Now Miraculous Ladybug has four or five seasons with a dozen or two episodes each and a pretty large cult following. So let's just say I was severely behind. Looking at Astruc's portfolio, I was really surprised to see that he'd worked on shows like Witch and Totally Spies because I grew up on those shows and I definitely see those influences in MLB. Which is to say it had as much substance as a preteen gossip magazine. Or your average BuzzFeed article, I guess. I'll be honest, the immense number of episodes really intimidated me, which is why I put up a community post asking my Kalimaris which episodes of Miraculous I should watch if I wanted to get into the series, and a lot of you recommended not getting into the series at all, or watching only the first two seasons because apparently seasons 3 and 4 were garbage. And I'm really glad I asked because I tried doing a normal watch through and like any reasonable human being, I started watching with the first episode and it literally felt like I skipped a whole episode or two. I initially watched it in the French dub because I find that the intentions and emotions tend to carry over better in the original dub before I realized that I could not give the show my full attention without getting frustrated and annoyed like I was watching a kid's content creator on YouTube, so I went back to the English dub and played it in the background while I drew. 
I suspected that it must have a similar setup as Steven Universe, where it has key episodes that contain important plot and story development, but otherwise it's mostly Monster of the Week or Steven bumming around in Beach City while the Crystal Gems go off and do cool stuff without him. So I was in trouble because I could barely make it through the first episode. Because of that, I took to the Miraculous Wiki to read through the timeline they had of the show in chronological order because I knew I wasn't going to survive a full watch through of it. Now I have a rough understanding of the full lore of the show, but I still wanted to watch some episodes to get a feel for what the series is really like. My lovely Calimaris really came to the rescue and recommended that I watch season 1 backwards starting from the last two episodes, Origins Part 1 and 2. A lot of you also recommended Stormy Weather, which I also watched. And after watching in that order, everything made much more sense. I've pretty much finished all 26 episodes of season 1 by now and watched some character and show analyses on YouTube and I have some thoughts. By all means, Miraculous Ladybug should be my absolute favorite show, but I feel like I'm just outside of the age group they were aiming for. And that in itself speaks volumes about the show, considering that they weren't able to keep the attention of someone who still unironically watches episodes of My Little Pony Friendship is Magic, despite having everything I would want in a show. Romance between two superpowered main characters, magical girl transformations, gimmicky attacks, and animal themes. See. My favorite show growing up was Tokyo Mew Mew, and Miraculous Ladybug is literally modern day Tokyo Mew Mew set in Paris, except maybe worse and I will get into why. I genuinely believe that if I'd grown up watching Miraculous Ladybug, I would absolutely eat it up. But because I'm coming into it as an adult, uh, the odd story choices, large movements, and exaggerated wacky facial expressions just threw me off too much to be able to get into it. I mentioned before that one of the creators and directors of the show used to work on Totally Spice, and while the pleasant aesthetics and appeal to a young girl demographic carried over, everything that is wrong with Totally Spice is also present in Miraculous Ladybug. For example, the character and story beats are extremely trite, there's a predictable will-they-won't-they they romance, acting like ooh maybe they won't end up together even though we clearly know they are gonna end up with each other eventually. Each episode is super formulaic, down to the obligatory hawk moth monologues at the middle and end of every episode where he makes bad puns about revenge and getting the miraculous with the little jingle that every single time makes me go It's so French! And speaking of the villain, he is shockingly incompetent, even in comparison to how incompetent the heroes are themselves. I mean, Doofenshmirtz from Phineas and Ferb is just as incompetent as Hawk Moth, but at the very least, that show is self-aware enough to play into his goofiness, whereas MLB takes Hawk Moth way too seriously. Like, bro, you realize doing the same thing over and over again while expecting a different outcome is the definition of insanity, right? At least according to that one video game cutscene. Maybe just rethink your plan a bit, because it's failed like at least 50 times now. The characters are also constantly abusing their powers and prioritizing the most menial, stupid thing over their hero responsibilities and people's safety, but then I remember that these characters are literally 13 and I think, yeah, I guess they would do that. And literally none of the damage that happens ever has any lasting consequences, which we will get into later. When you're 13, your brain is still in the process of developing. It hasn't even like fully grown in yet. So it's safe to say that putting the literal fate of an entire city solely on the shoulders of these children is just asking for trouble. However, there are things that 13 year olds probably don't do that the characters in the show do a lot and gets taken way too far to an extreme level and is arguably the weakest part of the show, littered with double standards, no self-awareness, and is one of the main focuses of the show. Marinette and Adrian's relationship. And this is arguably also the weakest part of Marinette's character. 
。C. Subtracting their entire romance from the show. Each episode has a nice message to teach children. Marinette is a talented, well-adjusted teen, and as Ladybug, she's confident and clever. And I really like that she uses her brains to take down opponents instead of unspecified super special magic that no character can resist. At the age Marinette is, it's almost a given to be obsessed with crushes and liking someone. Among friend groups, I remember romance and relationships being the most fun thing to talk and gossip about. To the point you would kind of get left out if you didn't have a crush on anyone. So even if you didn't necessarily like that person all that much, you were just peer pressured into having that crush anyway. And at the end of the day, I think it's normal for young kids to over romanticize those things because they don't know any better. However, what isn't normal is just how far Marinette takes her crush and how unself-aware she and the show is about her obsession for Adrian. See, Marinette literally made a whole timetable for Adrian's routine. Stalks him, rifles through his garbage, and makes it her business to know every single thing about him without actually ever getting to know him. Her obsession with Adrian is something more similar to a preteen's crush to a big celebrity, where they know every single piece of trivia about that person, but they've never really interacted with them or gotten to know what they're really like in person. Because Marinette turns into a bumbling idiot every time Adrian talks to her. Kind of like another Asian high school girl we know, and trust me, the similarities go even deeper than you think. In the episode Gamer, Marinette was told by Kim that the Paris Ultimate Mecha Strike Three tournament is Max's whole life, and that he has been training all year to level up. And when she learns that Adrian is going to be teaming up with him, her takeaway is that the person with the highest score gets to team up with Adrian. So she wants to take Max's place in the tournament to be in the same team as Adrian. Yes, Marinette, let's completely rob this boy of his dreams so you can fulfill your selfish desires. And yeah, she does eventually offer to give up her spot on the team to him, but it's blatantly obvious that her crush on Adrian brings out the worst in her. She just turns into a monster when her love sickness comes in. When she is herself, she is actually a pretty good person. And I'm not saying that this wouldn't work at all the way it is. I think it's actually a really good character flaw. Except the show never really treats it like one. If anything, they treat it as a virtue, which I don't really like, and I find extremely disturbing. I'm actually really lost on how Marinette went from literally mistrusting Adrian and disliking him when they first met to realizing, hey, he's not such a bad person, to literally becoming a yandere for him. And yes, I will say it, she is a yandere because the definition of a yandere is literally sick in the head and love struck, which I think describes Marinette a lot better than what is currently written on her wiki. I find the description of Marinette's relationship to Adrian being a crush to be grossly inaccurate and underplays how they really depict her in the show. Obviously, so parents will look at it and are like, "Oh, that's cute. I think my young daughter would really enjoy that." But imagine if they said. Marinette has an obsession over Adrian, her crush, to the point she has stalked him, stolen his belongings, infiltrated his life, and sabotaged every other romantic rival who has never done harm onto her personally. Sound like anyone we know? I also find it funny that in all descriptions of Marinette, she is described as an aspiring fashion designer and is super artistic and creative, but. The show itself barely even remembers this. There are 26 episodes in season one, and of those 26 episodes, only four shows any hint of Marinette's design skills. Instead, the show has made her crush to Adrian her entire personality, and the first couple of seasons are supposed to be the best of the show. Like fans would all agree that this is Miraculous Ladybug at its finest, and yet I'm already irritated and disappointed. I think one of the biggest wasted opportunities of this show is the fact that they never address Marinette's self-doubt and low self-esteem. They just play it off for laughs when really there's a huge opportunity to explore the depth of Marinette's character. For example, maybe the reason she's so obsessed about her feelings to Adrian is because it distracts her from having to deal with her lack of self-worth and the stress of having to 
be a superhero for the whole of Paris, and it gives her positive emotions instead of anxiety from her imposter syndrome. So she uses her crush as a sense of escapism, maybe as a way to fill that hole inside herself instead of actually addressing her issues, because it's easier to do, and maybe she herself doesn't realize it either being so young. But no, instead the show just chucks her feelings for Adrian up to just true love, which no. <laughs> It really isn't. I was watching this YouTuber called Cyrus the Great, and there was a really good comment on his Why Marinette Dupin Cheng is a terribly written protagonist video essay, saying that Marinette only likes the idea of Adrian, but she doesn't like who Adrian really is because Adrian's true self is Chat Noir. The comment said that the mask slash costume frees him and he no longer needs to pay attention to what people expect of him as Adrian or to what extent his actions fall short of his father's fashion company. Under the mask, he can be completely himself. And we all know that Marinette can't stand Chat Noir, so no, she really doesn't like him. And where the double standards and lack of self-awareness come in is when another character who the show literally labels an obsessed fan does the exact same thing to Jagged Stone, a publicly adored celebrity in the episode Pixelator, Marinette finds it incredibly creepy and never makes the connection that she is that obsessed fan to Adrian. And the show never addresses this either, they just move on. Instead, the story and characters, including adult characters and Tiki, who is an immortal god that has existed since the beginning of the universe, fully support her actions and even applaud her for quote-unquote following her heart. And listen, as someone who was the target audience for these magical girl preteen shows and watched them growing up, I know that the lovesick boy crazy protagonist is practically a staple in the genre because the adult writers think it's just how all preteen girls are and it makes the characters relatable to their target audience, but even as a kid, I always found the crushes and boy troubles were the weakest part of the shows. Heck, every time the love interest shows up, I was always like, ugh, not him again. And it's pretty harmless for the most part, if you don't count the fact that it tells young girls that finding love in a romantic partner is the most important thing in life above everything else because it will magically make your life better, but the writers of MLB take it way too far, even for me. As far as I recall, Marinette is the only protagonist that is an outright obsessive stalker who never gets called out for it. So that's where my first possible alternative comes in. Maybe Marinette isn't really that interested in Adrian, but because she's in Paris, it's the city of love and everyone around her over romanticizes young love, she ends up putting on a front as a hopeless romantic because it makes her feel more accepted by her peers. It even suits her current personality perfectly, where she's very unsure of herself and is easily swayed by the people around her. Maybe her friends just gaslit her into thinking she was in love with Adrian. And it went like... Um, yeah, Adrian is kinda nice. He gave me an umbrella when I didn't, when it was raining that one time at school. And everyone was like, Oh my gosh, that's so romantic. He's totally into you, and you're definitely into him, right? This is a sign. You guys are meant to be together. And Marinette is like, Well, I, I don't know if it's that deep. And her friends are like, No, no, trust us. This is how it always works. And Marinette is like, Well, Okay, I guess, uh, alright, uh, yeah, I guess I do love him. And if the show really wanted to, Marinette can still fall in love with Adrian down the line, but have it be a slow process of her actually getting to know him and deciding that for herself, and maybe being reluctant to interact with him or commit to it because she thinks she isn't good enough for him, Instead of still having that mindset, but also making her foam at the mouth like some corn dog every time she's around him and creep on him anyway, like some weird possessive stalker. The show should also make more of an effort to showcase her creative side. 
fill her room with various dresses, hats, and artwork that she made. I imagine Marinette being the kind of person who likes thrifting and making new pieces from the clothes she bought, but she doesn't have the confidence to actually wear any of them out in public, thinking she wouldn't be able to pull it off. So I think her current casual outfit actually suits her. It's not too flashy, pretty plain, and it's clear that she's someone who doesn't really want to stand out, which is contrasted when she's actually Ladybug with a bright red suit. And speaking of her Ladybug suit, that is actually something we can play around with. From what I've seen, Marinette, despite having the oldest and arguably most powerful Kwame in existence, also has the plainest outfit. I looked it up on the wiki, and it's apparently because the Miraculous Holder has to accept their new status and be ready to be a hero, which Marinette is not, despite countless scenes in the show and movies proving otherwise, but okay. So, even though she is now also the guardian of the Miraculous, which is a responsibility leagues above just being a Miraculous holder that she accepted, she's still stuck with a red catsuit and black polka dots and a, a yo-yo around her waist. So, this is my next revision. Marinette should have her full costume, and there are two points in the series so far that would work as the catalyst. The first one would obviously be at the end of Origins Part 2, when Marinette declares to all of Paris that she vows to protect its citizens as Ladybug no matter what, which would mean she would have her full suit from the beginning, and the original plain suit only makes a brief cameo in the Origins series, which I think uh, it's fine, I don't really care, but then I'm not really an avid fan of Miraculous, so I don't know how offensive that is. Or, another point that could work is when she becomes the new guardian of the Miraculous, which I feel like at that point you're pretty much past the point of no return. So, this version that I'm drawing is my hypothetical full ladybug suit. After all, as an aspiring fashion designer, Marinette should have a bit more flair to her costume, no? The Ladybug Wiki states that the Miraculous Holder's appearance is not only influenced by their tastes and desires, but they are also able to choose what sort of costume they want specifically. We actually get to see Marinette's taste coming through in bits and pieces in the various iterations of her costumes, be it when she combines other Miraculous with her own, or when she uses other Miraculous to become an entirely different hero. From what I gather from these other variations is that Marinette is very proud of her Chinese heritage, and I think she looks best when she's proudly displaying it. I personally love how she looks as Multi Mouse because those twin buns suit her so well, and her costume as Lady Bee is just immaculate. Her dragon bug costume also suited her very well, and I think it just solidifies the fact that Marinette looks her best with a bit of gold on her costume. Immediately, I knew that I wanted Marinette to have twin buns like in her Multi Mouse costume, because I genuinely think they suit her better than her low twin tails. It just looks like she put a bit more effort into them, I guess. I also considered putting her hair in bun covers with a ladybug motif on it, but I decided against this because I thought it might be too much spots. For the mask, I decided I wanted to change up the shape a bit and make it look more distinct for Marinette. The way I did that was by shaping them to look like two ladybugs joined together. Among her costumes, this style of collar really caught my eye, so I wanted to incorporate that into my design as well. And because I went with that collar, I immediately got the idea of making Marinette's costume look like a Cheongsam with open-winged ladybug-like buttons on her chest, which I think not only helped to display her Chinese heritage, but also helped break up the costume's monotony by adding more segments to make the suit look a bit more complex. I also gave her a little ladybug-shaped skirt to sell the idea of the Cheongsam, and this Cheongsam idea also played really well into the twin buns I gave her, so I was really happy with that. Marinette also has ribbon ties hanging off her hair in her original suit, and I wanted to incorporate that in my design, so I thought it would be a cute idea to have them wrap around the buns and stick up like antennae on top of her head. Let me know what you guys think of this new suit I gave Marinette. Do you think I'd make it as the next Edna Mode in this universe? All in 
Nal, I think people sometimes go too hard on Marinette and forget that she is an actual child who never received any guidance from the adults or authority figures in her life who do know better. <coughs> Tiki. <coughs> Ooh. Uh, that cough just came out of nowhere. Because not only are they ignorant of what she's doing, they are also complacent in their ignorance at best and enabling her toxic behaviors at worst. In other words, she is exactly as spoiled as Chloe and as much of a compulsive liar as Lila, but she's the main protagonist, so it's, it's okay, right? And yeah, Marinette has some capability to learn from her mistakes and be better as a person. Some, not a lot, but some. But it's also annoying to hear Tiki telling her over and over again that she's the chosen one and she's amazing and at one point even says that she's the best ladybug. Like, Tiki, you've seen the shit she pulls. Just how low are your standards? And just as in my Yandere simulator videos, we have to talk about consequences or lack thereof. See. The way the show is structured completely prevents Marinette and the heroes from ever having to deal with consequences because it's episodic and everything needs to be reset back to the status quo so that the episode can be aired and rerun in any order the streaming service or TV station wants. Similar to Phineas and Ferb, but at the very least, some episodes or things that happened in previous episodes actually carry over, giving a sense of continuity which is very sparse in Miraculous Ladybug. And to really explain why, I want to direct you to Ladybug's powers. So, Ladybug basically has three main powers. The first one is Lucky Charm, where they take a page straight out of Mickey Mouse Clubhouse in the randomly generated items that you might need later, and Marinette has to figure out how to use that item. The second one is capturing the Akuma and de-evilizing them. And the third one, fixing all the damage that was done by both the villains and heroes, meaning they could literally destroy the city if they wanted to and it wouldn't matter. And that allows the heroes to be as reckless and careless as they want, so they can never really make mistakes they can learn from in the first place. So how can characters develop if they were never allowed to make mistakes or face consequences for their actions in the first place? And that is my third revision get rid of Ladybug's damage reversal power. Now all the collateral damage and smashed up property don't just go away after Ladybug purifies the Akuma and it only turns the victim back to normal. Force the characters to fight more cleanly and carefully and have them learn to do damage control for the villains. Maybe after the first fight, Marinette and Adrian realizes how their negligence caused a lot of people to get injured and hundreds of thousands of euros in property damage and they go, oh shit, this is real, and they have to train to use their powers better to minimize damage in their next fights. This also forces the characters to grow up a lot faster in order to shoulder that burden, preventing them from enjoying their teenage years because they don't have the blissful ignorance of their peers anymore. Maybe that could be one of the bonding points between Marinette and Adrian. You can still play this out in a comedic way, of course. Maybe have Marinette whining to Tiki that she can't go out and have fun with her friends because she's too busy training and preparing for the next Akuma attack and she wants some time to just be a kid. Or they can go really dark with it and have Marinette attend a funeral of a person that died because she failed to rescue them in time. I don't know. I think another plotline that should have been introduced is also Marinette and Adrian actually attempting to track down the source of the Akumas instead of just dealing with them as they come. I always find it kind of weird that they never try to investigate where the Akumas were coming from or why each villain they face are constantly going after their miraculous. And as far as I recall, Tiki never tells Marinette anything about who creates the Akumas in the first place or why this might be happening and why it's such a big deal. Y you know, basic background information Marinette should know about. And that is my fourth revision. Tiki. Just everything about Tiki and her role in Marinette's life. Instead of being a passive bystander to all of Marinette's antics, I feel like they should have a more active role as Marinette's mentor. 
Right now, they're giving me too much white mom who lets their kids get away with everything vibes, and I want that bug to drill the entire history and legacy of the miraculous and former ladybugs into Marinette early on. Just lay down all the facts, traumatize the child. And then, I want Tiki to actually train Marinette to use her powers and teach her to not only be a good superhero, but a decent human being because by god, her parents aren't going to. Every time Marinette is going to do something juvenile and stupid, have Tiki be there like, No, you're dumb. Don't do that, it's dumb. And then have them throw the I'm not mad, just disappointed line at Marinette when she does it anyway. Whip her up into shape, you know? Trauma adds flavor. Since Tiki and Plague are supposed to be yin and yang, each other's opposites, it makes sense that if Plague is completely uninterested in Adrian's growth as Chat Noir, forcing Adrian to take on the more proactive role in training and learning his miraculous history, Tiki should be the overly invested helicopter parent that cares too much about Marinette's growth as Ladybug. It gives them an interesting flaw and more intrigue than just ass kisser. Because seriously, all Tiki ever does is praise Marinette, even when she really doesn't deserve it, and tells us, the audience, that she is special, and a great person, and the chosen one. Come on people, show, don't tell. If you have to constantly tell us that Marinette is a great person, then maybe she isn't, and you haven't been doing a great job of showing it. And I think it gives the show room to develop their relationship, and Marinette as well. Like, Marinette puts her foot down and stands up to Tiki, telling her that she needs space to actually grow and become her own superhero, and Tiki realizes that they've been trying to shape Marinette into the ladybug they wanted her to be without ever considering what Marinette wanted. Maybe we even learn that the last ladybug perished because Tiki didn't train them hard enough, and they didn't want the same thing to happen to Marinette. Marinette, so that's why they pushed her so hard. But that's just my opinion. This is for you. From what I've been told, the characters and story just get worse as the show goes on, and I don't think I can put myself through that. So if anyone wants to send me the cliff notes of everything wrong with seasons 3 and 4, I would really appreciate it. I know that they eventually give out Kwamis to more characters because the series is meant to make money from selling toys and merchandise, and the more characters and Kwamis there are, the more variety you can sell of them. I also know that they introduced this guy named Luca, who is also in love with Marinette and is an obvious red herring to Marinette and Adrian's relationship, but I'm not sure what's going on there. Oh yeah! Can we also talk about the sheer number of guys that are just in love with Marinette? Not even Ladybug, just Marinette. It's one of my least favorite tropes to have an average girl who is actually very beautiful but she doesn't know it and everyone is actually in love with her but she's too oblivious to realize it. Well, I mean Marinette does kind of realize it, she just doesn't like anyone but Adrian. The whole stalker thing, you know how it is. But I think my main issue with the show and shows like this in general, is that they always hyperfixate on the boy trouble, which is always done in the most ham-fisted way. And I'll be honest, I watch these magical girl shows for the super sparkly transformation sequences and fight scenes and magical powers, so I think it would have been a better show if it focused more on those aspects. Otherwise, it's really impressive for a kids show. It's pretty and well animated. It's clear that a lot of work was put into it and I really like the world building and lore. I definitely see what people mean when they say it has wasted potential because the concept they struck up is really unique if not ambiguously orientalist and uncomfortable to watch sometimes. But it is a perfectly designed setting to sustain a large fandom. It's open-ended enough where you could make an OC pretty easily and fit them into the world. You can make a Kwame out of anything, pick any animal, and BAM! You're a miraculous holder, you don't even have to live in Paris. But wouldn't it be funny if we had a magical girl show where the protagonist was a depressed and disillusioned 20-something year old fresh out of university working a shitty unpaid internship somewhere? And instead of the quirky, awkward humor, it's like a black comedy. I would watch that. Actually, let me know if you guys would want to make <laughs> would want me to make that idea someday. 
thank you so much for making it all the way to the end of the video. And I hope you guys enjoyed today's topic and stick around for more videos like this. If you want to see more from me, then join my Discord server. I post exclusive sneak peeks there all the time and it's totally free. Check out my social media and my comic because that will make me really happy. All the links are in the description, including my Ko-fi account if you want to donate a coffee my way. And I will see you guys next year. Goodbye!